I'm Claire Ridgway and I'm back again with a special talk uh, in commemoration of the fact that it's hallow tide at the moment. Now today's talk is based on an article I did back in 2009, so 10 years ago, on witchcraft in Tudor and Stuart times and I thought it was fitting to share it today um, on Halloween or the eve of all hallows as I'm sure that there will be lots of people around the world dressed as witches ready to go off to Halloween parties or to go trick or treating. Today we view medieval and Tudor people as rather a superstitious bunch. After all, they used very old-fashioned and what we see as nonsensical beliefs and astrology as well to explain the world. And they used all kinds of weird remedies, potions, charms, amulets and horoscopes to cure illness, to protect themselves and to deal with problems. Some of the remedies for health complaints make me laugh out loud or cringe in horror. For example, the brains of a freshly killed hare can be rubbed on, on a baby's gums to ease teething pain, or your own faeces mixed with honey can be applied to an abscess on the tonsils. Ugh. It all sounds ridiculous to us today, but I do wonder if people in hundreds of years' time will be laughing at some of what we do now. What I found interesting in my research into Tudor times and people like famous astrologer, mathematician and genius John Dee and also his partner Edward Kelly is that religion, astrology and the use of charms went hand in hand in medieval and Tudor times. It was common for monarchs to consult astrologers to read their nativity charts or to pick auspicious days for events such as coronations or weddings, as John Dee did for Elizabeth I's coronation. And it was the norm for common people to consult wise men or cunning women about health problems, money problems or marital problems. It all seems very weird looking back on it with our 21st century eyes, but who are we to judge? I mean, people today consult their horoscopes, have lucky charms and mascots, wish each other luck and so on. But let's move on to magic and witchcraft. People who practiced white magic or good magic were known as wise men or cunning women and they used their gifts to try and help people. There was the belief that the seventh son of a seventh son would be a white witch and things like slight physical blemishes or deformities were signs of having the gift. A Channel 4 article called The Time Traveller's Guide to Tudor England gave historical examples of white magic being used. Adam Squire, the master of Balliol College, 1571 to 1580, would sell gamblers a familiar, a spirit or fly, to give them luck at playing dice. A cunning woman being sent for by church wardens in Thatch in Berkshire in 1583 to find the thief who stole the communion cloth from the church. Thomas Ross's book, Natural and Artificial Conclusions, 1567, taught people how to walk on water. And then there were prophecies. Elizabeth Barton, the Holy Maid of Kent, or Nun of Kent, prophesied that Henry VIII would meet disaster if he divorced Catherine of Aragon. Barton was apparently visited by the Virgin Mary, who gave her this prophecy but the Virgin Mary couldn't save her be for, from being hanged for treason for speaking out against the king. Then there were charms. These could be purchased from wise men or women to ward off evil, to bring good luck, to cure illness, to prevent drunkenness, to find lost property, to get rid of vermin, to get children to sleep, to make someone fall in love with you, to determine the sex of a baby, to put out fires and all other manner of things. They were part of everyday life and not seen as evil and not seen as incompatible with religion either. In fact, during labour, a woman might use religious relics to help and protect her and charms. You might as well use everything when labour was so dangerous, I guess. 
The Tudor angel coin, a coin originally issued by Edward IV in the 1460s and featuring the archangel St. Michael trampling on a dragon's head, was also used as a charm. It was believed that it could ward off evil spirits and bad luck. But what about witches? Well, Tudor people may not have been against using charms to help them, but they did fear witches, those who used their magical gifts for evil. George Gifford, a preacher from Essex, said, If there were no witches, there should be no plagues. And his words show that the people of the time blamed natural disasters on witches and witchcraft. And they thought that they could prevent such disasters if they got rid of people thought to be witches. In 1542, England's first law against witchcraft was enacted, making witchcraft punishable by death. This act was repealed a few years later, but further acts were passed in 1563 and 1604. These acts led to widespread fear and paranoia, witch hunts, and many innocent and gifted women being accused of witchcraft and even being hanged. Ethnographer and folklorist Eva Pox explains that there are three main categories of witches. One, the neighbourhood witch or social witch. For example, a person who would curse their neighbour after an argument. Two, the sorcerer or magical witch. This label covers healers, seers, sorcerers, and even midwives, or anyone thought to use magic to increase their fortune to the detriment of their community. Three, the knight or supernatural witch, a person who appears as a demon in visions or dreams. As you can see from these definitions, it would be very easy for a person to be labelled as a witch because of arguments, tensions in villages and neighbourhoods, or their skills at healing or in helping women with childbirth. Many of those accused of witchcraft in the Tudor and Stuart period were old women who were poor and lived by themselves, or women who were on the fringes of society who didn't fit in, who perhaps didn't live up to society's norms and expectations. If a woman like this fell out with their neighbour, shouted a curse at them in the heat of the moment, and then that neighbour suffered some kind of ill fortune, then the woman could be accused of causing the ill fortune or accident by her curse, by witchcraft. More than 90% of those accused of witchcraft between 1450 and 1750 were women, and this is probably because they were seen as weaker and therefore more willing to do the devil's work. Women were also seen as temptresses, and perhaps this harkens back to the fall of man, the original sin, where Eve sinned and then caused Adam to sin also. So how many people were actually tried and executed for witchcraft in England? Well, this is hard to answer. Here are some statistics from different sources. In a Channel 4 article, um, it states that in Essex in the 1580s, 13% of assize trials were for witchcraft and that out of 64 people accused of witchcraft, 53 were found guilty. In an article, Women in Tudor and Stuart Times, it states that 3,000 women were officially tried for witchcraft in England between 1563 and 1700, and out of those, 400 were hanged. Witches and witchcraft in the medieval world states that there were 785 cases involving 474 witches tried by the home circuit, that's the sizes in Essex, Hertfordshire, Kent, Surrey and Sussex between 1558 and 1709. Only 104 were hanged, but 209 were convicted. However, this article points out that these figures only take into account formal trials and don't take into account action taken against people thought to be witches by their local communities. Witch trials in early modern Europe cite statistics from Ronald Hutton, author of Pagan Religions of the Ancient British Isles, and states that over a 250-year period, 
228 executions for witchcraft were recorded, but it's thought that the actual figure could be anywhere between 300 and 1,000. But why the witch hunts and why this paranoia? Well, in my research on witches and witchcraft, it became obvious to me that allegations of witchcraft could be used by the church to control or get rid of people whose beliefs did not fit in with accepted religious beliefs, by communities to get rid of people who were causing arguments and conflicts, or by husbands to rid themselves of annoying wives. I suspect that such allegations were also caused by fear of the unknown, such as the skills of midwives and herbalists, and the need to blame someone and something for accidents and disasters. It is sad to think that many innocent, free-thinking women and skilled practitioners were labelled as witches and imprisoned or hanged. The most famous witch trials in British history are of course the Pendle Witches or Lancashire Witches. Ten of the 13 witches were hanged in 1612 at Lancaster Jail after having been found guilty of witchcraft. It was alleged that the 13 witches had caused the deaths of around 17 people in the forest of Pendle area by using witchcraft and that they got the power to kill and harm by selling their souls to familiars. The witches were accused of causing death to their victims by making effigies known as pictures of clay, which they then crumbled or burned over a period of time. However, the Essex witches deserve to be remembered, and I spoke about three of them in my 5th of July talk. 31 Essex people, 30 women and one man, were accused of witchcraft under the 1563 Witchcraft Act, full name, an act against conjurations, enchantments and witchcrafts. According to this act, anyone who did use, practice or exercise any witchcraft, enchantment, charm or sorcery, whereby any person shall happen to be killed or destroyed, was to be put to death. They were executed by hanging for murder by witchcraft, rather than being burnt like their Scottish counterparts. It really is scary just how many innocent people, mainly women, were executed as witches. I find it fascinating how religion was such an integral part of people's lives at this time, but so was superstition. It's something I'm going to be exploring in October 2020 with tour organiser Philippa Lacey Brawl and historian Leslie Smith on the Tudor and Stuart Witchcraft and Medicine Tour. We even get to visit Colchester Castle, the place where many of those accused of witchcraft were imprisoned. I think I'll find that incredibly humbling and emotional. Now, we still have places left on that tour, so please do consider coming along with us. I will give you a link uh, to find out more about it and also to book your place with a deposit. I'm very, very excited. I'm very excited about learning more about superstitions and, and how religion, medicine, superstition, witchcraft, it was all kind of intermingled in that period. And, and also commemorating the lives of the Essex witches, women that mean quite a lot to me. I'm very, very interested in their lives and of course their ends. So please do find out more about that. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, look at uh, witchcraft in the Tudor and Stuart period. Uh, the bells are ringing out for those innocent women accused of witchcraft. And I will see you soon with more Tudor history information. Bye-bye.